on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere go. Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. It was in a humble manger that Jesus Christ was born. The God of all creation became a child that mourned. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Take your Bible now this morning, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Matthew chapter 2, please. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Verses 1 through 9 of Matthew chapter 2. And we'll read them responsibly, as we normally do. Begin together on verse 1, then... I'll read verse 2, we're together on 3, and alternating until we end together on verse 9 of Matthew chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1. Ready? Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. <clears throat> and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful music today and for the good fellowship, the good spirit that's in this place. And Father, we're asking you now that you will continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word this morning. And I pray, God, that our hearts would be good soil, that the word of God would fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives, that the word preached would be heard being mixed with faith in them that hear it. 
And Lord, I pray it'll be in a profitable time. Bless the special to that end, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Who is he in yonder stall? At whose feet the shepherds fall? Who is he that stands and weeps? At the grave where Lazarus sleeps. Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Lo, at midnight to is he, brazen dawn. Who is he in Calvary's throes, asks for blessings on his foes? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of glory, at his feet we humbly fall, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Who is he? That from the grave comes to heal and help and save. Who is he that from yon throne rules the world of light alone? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and thank you for sending a Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. That he might live a perfect, sinless life and yet go to the cross and die on the cross as a substitute for our sin, as a payment for our sin, taking our place. And Lord, we want to tell you that we love you this morning. <clears throat> We're asking you to meet with us and speak to our hearts through your word today. I pray, Lord, that you'd give us understanding as we look at this truth, not only from Matthew chapter 2 and the wise men, but really throughout the New Testament and throughout the life of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'd use the truth in each heart, each listener that's here this morning. May your will be done in each heart and life. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. The wise men, and I know in most of your nativity scenes, there's three of them, and, and that's probably because they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and so we believe there probably were three, but there could have been many wise men uh, at the time coming. They had seen the star, the star of Jacob, as the Old Testament would say, and they came to seek the Messiah. They came to seek the one that was born king of the Jews. And they came bearing gifts. And that's uh, interesting that they wanted to give to him. It's quite different from many today that kind of expect God to give everything to them. Uh, these folks knew that they ought to give something to the Lord Jesus. They ask a question, if you have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 2, verse number 2. They ask, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Did you notice they didn't ask, where is the Messiah? They did not ask, where is the Christ child? They did not ask, where is the Son of God? It was because of the question they asked that Herod got so concerned and wanted to know exactly when they first saw the star and Herod got so upset and so concerned, he ordered that all the 
children two years of age and under, all the male children would be put to death. It was because of the question they ask. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? You see, he was upset because a king was born. In Herod's eyes, there's no room for two thrones in a kingdom. And the kingdom was his, and he was going to eliminate any competition. And so innocent blood flowed, and deep pain and sorrow was inflicted, because a baby was born a king. And that continued all through Jesus' time on earth. Kings on thrones were always trying to kill him. Kings of politics were always trying to kill him. Kings of religion were always trying to kill him because he jeopardized their thrones. Had he come as a physician, they would have praised him. Had he come as a philosopher, they would have honored him. Had he come as an educator, they would have idolized him. But he claimed to be a king. If he came as a companion and a friend, they would have loved him. But he claimed to be a king. He spoke differently. He spoke as one having authority. He spoke... And men were put in awe. He spoke as if His Word was the final authority. He spoke and expected men to obey what He said. He spoke as a king. He spoke and did not hesitate to ask men to lay down their life. That's the way of a king. The problem is, He didn't look like a king. <clears throat> there was no pomp and circumstance that surrounded him. There was no scepter that he carried. There was no royal robe that he wore. There was no chariot to ride in or no horse that he rode on and certainly no army that followed him. He just didn't look like a king. And so for him to say he was a king seemed a bit outrageous but he claimed to be king. And by the way, it was that claim that would lead him to his death. The crowd outside of Pilate's judgment hall shouted, He said He is Christ the King. Turn in your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. Pilate <clears throat> calls Jesus aside. And in John 18 and verse 37, John 18 and verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, and to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Notice verse 39. Pilate, well, Pilate says in verse 38 that the very last sentence, he said, I find no fault at all in him, no fault at all. But verse 39, you have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Notice, will ye therefore that I release unto you Jesus? Is that what he said? No. Will you therefore release unto you this priest? No. This prophet? No. Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Oh, they didn't like that. And they cried out, of course, for Barabbas. I want you to look down in chapter 19 of John and look at verse number 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your, what church? King. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. 
He sets him before the crowd and says, Here, behold your king. And they all cry out, We don't have a king. We only have Caesar that we answer to. The soldiers led him away. When they led him away, the Bible says they took a purple robe royalty and they put it on him. And then they took a crown. They made a crown up of thorns and they smashed that crown down upon his head. They put a mock little, I think they would put a mock little scepter in his hand and then they begin to mock him. Make fun of him. Hail, King. They would hit him. Saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Beaten. Abused by the soldiers. Then taken to Calvary and nailed to a cross. But wait. There's a superscription written above the cross. It's written in three languages, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. It was the usual custom of the Romans when a man would be put to death by crucifixion that they would affix to the cross in some place what his crime was or what the accusation was that had been brought against him. So people who had passed by, crucifixions were always done in a public place, and so people who passed by would be able to see and they'd be able to read what his crime was that caused this public execution. Whether he murdered someone or stole from someone or whatever the crime may be, they would know. The Bible says Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. Those who had done wrong and was treated just as they were. And so if accusations were published, his accusation would have to be published. Written over his head, just as if he'd been a common criminal. Can you imagine? Do you understand now when the Bible says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death? Even the death of the cross. Because he was numbered with the transgressors. They read in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It's a remarkable thing. Matthew and Luke say, as he did, this is the king of the Jews. And then they, they came to Pilate. And they said, no, 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 don't write, this is the king of the Jews. Write, he said, I'm the king of the Jews. And Pilate, to his credit, said, what I've written, I have written. This is Jesus. When you put the four gospel accounts together, it reads, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. As a teacher, Jesus would have had many admirers. His moral teachings were accepted. In fact, one of the rules He mentioned and talked about was became known to us as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so they accept His precepts. They accept His moral teachings. The parable of the Good Samaritan is still praised as a model for helping someone in need. They would honor Him as a teacher or a philosopher or a poet or as an idealist. But they hesitate when they're asked to accept Him as a king. Yet he's adamant. He does not settle for less. He demands swift and adamant subjection to him as a king. Two weeks from tomorrow will be Christmas Day. When you think of Christmas, 
and the birth of Christ. What do you think about? A baby? A Savior? A teacher? An example? Or a king? You see, man's chief objection to Jesus Christ is his authority. That inscription that Pilate put above the cross of Jesus Christ was Jesus is the King. It isn't Jesus was the teacher. If he'd have put Jesus was the teacher, they could say, let him teach whatever he wants. It's nothing to us. Or Jesus the prophet, well, let him prophesy whatever he wants. He could have said, Jesus the priest. And they said, well, we'll content to let him be a priest. That's no difference to us. But when he put Jesus is the king, they begin to shoot their arrows and said, he will not be king. In Psalms chapter 2, the Bible says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Most of human nature is exactly like the chief priests and the religious people of the day when Jesus was crucified. When Pilate said, Behold your king. And they cried out, We will not have this man to rule over us. Men today are willing for Christ to save them, but not willing for Christ to reign over them. Oh, I want a Savior. I don't want to burn in hell. I want a Savior, but I don't want a King. Nobody's telling me how to live. Nobody's telling me what I can do. Nobody's telling me where I can go. I want a Savior, but I don't want a King. I don't want Christ to reign over me. When He says, love your neighbor as yourself. When he says, you have to forgive 70 times 7. When he talks about the law of love and kindness and gentleness. When you begin to try to realize that he is the king and I'm to live as he says. Oh my friend, then that begins to cramp your covetousness. It begins to condemn self-righteousness. It begins to pull in the reins of your own ambition. And people get offended. People buck and fight. He's king. But Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. When He begins to teach absolute purity, when he says that even a lustful glance is a sin, men reply, he won't rule over me. He will not rule over me. They hang him up to die and crucify him on the cross because they will not submit to his authority. I would submit to you this morning, Bible Baptist Church, He's not just a Savior to save. He is a King to be obeyed. Where is He that is born King of the Jews? A King tells you how to live. A King tells you where to go. A King tells you how to act. A King tells you how to speak. Are you willing to submit to Jesus Christ being your King? 
Or will, are you like the rulers of that day and you'll say, I'll not have that man to rule over me. Will you say like they said, we have no king but Caesar. I wonder if the lost of this world looks at Christians who do as they please, go where they please, talk as they please, dress as they please. Couldn't they ask the question, where is he that is born king? Where is he that is born king? On a talk show several years ago, were several people who were living immoral, immoral lives, living really in immorality. And one, most of them were very positive that they were very happy in their immoral relationships. Some living together without being married. Some having affairs with people that were married. Just living in immorality. And when someone raised the question of morality and the Bible... One woman took offense and she said, wait a minute, I'm a Christian, but I want everyone to know that my personal life and my religion don't interfere with one another. She went on to say, quote, I believe in a God who wants me to be happy, and if this makes me happy, then God approves of the relationship. There's someone, and I cannot say if if Christ is her Savior or not, but I'll guarantee you this, He's not her King. She's saying, I will not have that man to rule over me. And let me just clarify something. God is not ultimately concerned with your happiness or my happiness. He is ultimately concerned with your holiness and my holiness. God is holy and, and we're to be holy for He is holy. And I'll guarantee you this, if you will be holy, if you will allow God to work in your life and you'll live a holy life, you will be happy. Don't think holiness means I'm going to be miserable. No, I'll testify to you. Holiness is happiness. Living for God. Living the way the Lord tells you to live. A lot of people today believe just like this woman stated. Whatever makes me happy, and if it makes me happy, then God approves of it. I'm not sure where they got that teaching, but they didn't get it from the Bible. But it's been around for a long time. People have always wanted God to put a place, a, a, His stamp of approval upon their lifestyle. Never require any change for the better. And we come up with euphemisms or different terms to make it sound okay. There was a day when, and in and, and a day even in my ministry of 35 years, early in my pastorate, I, I recall just as clear as day visiting people, knocking on doors giving the gospel to folks and, and, and I'd see them receive Christ as their Savior and then I would, I would say to if it's a woman, if I would say now, now about your husband, is, is he a Christian? And I'd watch her. Or sometimes if it's a man, I'd say, now what about your wife? Is she a Christian? After the man accepted Christ and I'd see him hang their head and I said, are they not saved? He said, well, it's not really my wife. We're just living together. They were ashamed of it. We used, to have, we used to call that living in sin. Now, someone lives with someone else and they're not married, they just say, well, we're in a committed relationship. Well, that's a euphemism. That's a, that's a nice way of, of trying to uh, put, a, put a new coat. But you know what? It, it is exactly what the Bible says it is. It is immorality. I'm not trying to hurt you today. I'm not trying to be your enemy, but I'm trying to tell you the truth. We used to call abstinence, and when you're abstinence and you totally abstain from things that are wrong, they call it now neurotic inhibition. 
We used to call abortion for what it was, killing unborn babies. How did that ever become pro-choice? You see how we've changed the wording of things? Because we, we, I want to I wanna believe in a God. I want to believe in a God, but I don't want Him to mess anything up with what I want to do in my life. Yeah, I don't want to die and go to hell. Who wants to go burn? Yeah, I don't want that, so God save me from there, but then leave me alone. I want a Savior. I don't want a King. But He came to be King. Are you subject to the King? Is, is He on the throne of your heart today? You see, there's only one throne. Either you are on the throne of your heart, or God is. There's not room for two. Wise men still seek Him as King. Is He your King? There's an old hymn that says, King of my life, I crown Thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget Thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget Thine agony. Lest I forget Thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. The wise men bowed that day and gave gifts in obedience to a king. They, they, they gave their gifts to a king. And I'll submit to you this morning, wise people today still do that. I want you to go to the last book of the Bible with me. The book of Revelation. It's not the book of Revelations. It's the book of Revelation. Singular. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I want you to look with me at chapter 19, please. When Jesus was done with His time on earth, He resurrected from the dead. He was alive for 40 days after the resurrection. And then He ascended back to heaven. The disciples were there. They saw Him. And they watched Him go up and angels appeared. You find this recorded in Acts chapter 1. And the angels said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. So they had a promise that Jesus is going to come back. Jesus will come again. That's His promise. And when He returns, look with me at Revelation 19. When He returns, verse 15, And out of His mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it He should smite the nations, and He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. What is it, church? King of kings and Lord of lords. When he returns, he's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Where is he that is born king? of the Jews. Is He King of your life? Oh, I didn't ask if you were saved. I hope you've received Him as your Savior. I hope you've been forgiven of your sin and you have the gift of eternal life by faith in Jesus Christ. But that's not the end. That's the beginning. He came as a King. What are you doing with the King? By rebelling, by saying, I'm not doing that. Well, I know the Bible says this, but you're basically saying what they, they, they said. I will not have this man to rule over me. If your hymn book is close by there, there's a song in the hymn book, number 136. 
We sing it occasionally here with the Christmas carols. I want you to look at that song with me. There's a song in the air. Do you have it? Do you notice there's a song in the air? There's a star in the sky. There's a mother deep, deep prayer and a baby's low cry. And the star rains at fire while a beautiful sing. For the manger of Bethlehem cradles what? A king. There's a tumult of joy or the wonderful birth for the virgin sweet boy is the Lord of the earth. I, the star, rains its fire while the beautiful sing for the manger of Bethlehem cradles a king. In the light of that star lie the ages impearled and that song from afar has swept over the world. Every hearth is aflame and the beautiful sing in the homes of the nations that Jesus is king. We rejoice in the light and we echo the song that comes down through the night from the heavenly throng. I, we shout to the lovely evangel they bring and we greet in His cradle our Savior and King. I hope He's your Savior this morning. But I'm praying you'll allow Him to be your King. Will you bow your knee and say, Lord, you're not just my Savior. You're my king. I will allow you to rule over my life. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. The great need of this hour is for Christians to live like they have a king. Someone who rules over us. And his name is Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Just from the question of the wise men, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And Lord, my prayer today is that every person in the room would first know you as their Savior. That they would have a time when they've trusted Jesus Christ to forgive their sin and to give them the gift of eternal life so they could be in heaven one day. But Lord, teach us that that's just the beginning. That we too should bow our knee and worship Christ the King. I pray that each one of us would bow the knee to you this morning. Look in our heart. And say, Lord, you sit on the throne of my heart, not me. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to talk as you want me to talk. I want to live as you want me to live. I want to do as you want me to do.